Well, okay, let's get started. Uh, looks like everybody that's online right now probably knows me pretty well, but in case someone is looking at this later on, uh, my name is Mark Palladino. I'm the guest uh, teacher today at the uh, Lord of the Harvest Adult Bible Study. I'd like to welcome you. Uh, I uh, have a long history with uh, Lord of the Harvest and with uh, Pastor Oz. Uh, we go back about 50 years, and I'm not going to get into all of that, but um, I also spent uh, about 14 years here with uh, Lord of the Harvest from 2004 till I believe it was 2018. The church graciously sent my wife Judy and I out to uh, pursue some other interests. And uh, we're currently involved with the uh, Shepherd's Gate Church in Shelby Township. Judy's uh, part of the administration, administrative staff. And I'm, uh, of course, working with the teaching ministry and uh we're really enjoying it. I think God's going to use us to hopefully uh, touch some hearts there as well as they've done a lot to touch our hearts as well. So it seems like a, a good move and uh, we're just looking forward to good things. It's good to be back having the opportunity to share with you. Uh, I really want to thank Pastor Oz for offering me this opportunity. Um, what I'm going to talk about today, and if you, while you're turning, matter of fact, while you're turning to Daniel 2, let's just pray and Father, we thank you uh, for uh, your word. We thank you for the opportunity to come under your word today. And Lord, I praise you that you are not, you are a God without limits. And so uh, being unable to gather together right now for a short season uh, and, and, and the technology being the means by which we're communicating with one another, Lord, we know that you are not limited uh, by our absence, by our separation, Lord. And uh that you are able to pierce our hearts and speak your word into our beings uh, through this uh, uh, this mode. And we just thank you for that, Lord. And uh, we ask for uh, understanding as we come under your word. We ask for clarity. And uh, I pray, Lord, that uh, you'll just have your way and that Christ will be glorified. And we pray it in his name. Amen. And as I said, if you turn to Daniel 2 um, this morning, we're going to talk a little bit about the idea of interpretation. You know, I, I'm, I'm actually working on my second book. Obviously, most of you know I wrote one in 2011, published it. I'm working on another one. We're not going to get into the content of that one. It'll probably raise some eyebrows. It might get me in trouble. I don't know. But uh, th this new book that I've been working on is a bit more massive than the first one, and it's caused me to think a lot about the subject of interpretation, how we interpret, and especially the filters through which we process information. And uh, some of you may recall, Pastor Oz and I had both spoken on the uh, uh, Walter Brueggemann called the zone of imagination. It's this kind of filter where uh, things that uh, are vested interests and things like that, we filter what we hear, what we read, and how that those filters in our hearts and in our minds tend to transform or reconfigure what uh, what we're hearing, what we're saying. And so um, it's really important to have a clear heart. Um, what we hear, uh, how we hear it, how we process it, uh, these are both extremely important for uh, potentially formative for our life, our outlook, and our behavior. So um, as we begin to look at Daniel, and I'd like to take a moment to welcome you into my modest little man cave here in Utica, Michigan. This is Papa's study, as my grandkids call it. And this is where I uh, get most of my work done. And the books may look impressive, but I would guess that's probably what Pastor Oz reads in about a month. <laughs> so uh, anyway, Daniel 2. Daniel 2 is an interesting story. Daniel's in uh, Babylon. Uh, he's been taken captive uh, in the first wave of exiles in the in the Babylonian invasion of uh, of the land of Israel and the city of Jerusalem in the sixth uh, century BC, and uh, Daniel gets a place of uh, honor. He's given favor as a young man. He and uh, his three friends. And uh, in the course of time, uh, the king King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. And uh, that dream uh, needs to be interpreted, and none of his advisors can interpret it, so they call for Daniel. So Daniel's going to interpret this dream. And so we're going to read here in Daniel 2, beginning at oh, verse 31. 
And uh, in the course of our reading, I hope you have your Bibles open. I want you to keep reading, but I'm going to do something a little dramatic while we're reading. So I don't want it to, uh, it, it's important that we do this so that you catch the drift of what, uh, where this is going to take us. Um, so Daniel 2, uh, 31, it says, uh, You, O king, were looking, and behold, there was a single statue, a statue which was large and extraordinary splendor, standing in front of you, and its appearance was awesome. And the head of that statue was made of gold, and its breast and arms of silver and belly and thighs of bronze. And he goes on to describe the, the different metals and what's going to happen over up the, period, the course of time. Now, in verse 36, we begin with the interpretation. And Daniel says, this was the dream. Uh, now we will tell its interpretation before the king. You, O king, are the king of kings, to whom God, the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory. And wherever the sons of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, or the birds of the sky, he has given them into your hand, and caused you to be uh, rule over them all. You are the head of gold. After you, there will raise another kingdom inferior to you, and another and a third kingdom of bronze, which will rule over all the earth. After you, will raise another kingdom. Then there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, as much as uh, it, it soon crushes and shatters all things, so that iron breaks in pieces, it will crush and break all these pieces. And that you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay, partly of iron. It will be a divided kingdom, but it will have the toughness of iron as much as you saw the iron with common clay. And as the toes and feet were partly of iron and partly of pottery, some of the kingdom will be strong and part of it will be brittle. And in that you saw the iron mixed with common clay, they will combine with one another in the seed of men, but will not adhere to one another, even as iron does not combine with pottery. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all kingdoms, but itself will endure forever. Did you enjoy that? <laughs> the reason I covered my mouth is because when you read chapter 3, and I don't know how chapter 3 is in the exact chronology. I doubt that it happened the next day, but I think it's placed there in the next chapter immediately following the vision of chapter 2 for a reason. We read that Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold, the height of which was 60 cubits. That's about 90 feet. It's with 6 cubits, about 9 feet wide. And he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. My personal interpretation of this and why I covered my mouth is that I believe that Nebuchadnezzar stopped hearing when he heard, You, O king, are the head of gold, and God's given you all the kingdoms. And that prompted him, his own imagination, his own thought life, his own internal vested interest took over and at that point he stopped hearing the rest of the story because he was ruled by self-interest that's what eventually caused him in the next chapter here to create an image of gold an image of himself in other words nebuchadnezzar misunderstood that god was speaking about something much larger than himself and his own vested interest Daniel interpreted the dream, but Nebuchadnezzar misinterpreted Daniel. And because of that, Nebuchadnezzar made some very imprudent decisions leading him down a very bad path. This particular situation, this uh, uh, statue, ended up resulting in him putting three Hebrew children in a fiery furnace. It resulted later in him being humbled very much by God. And we're going to come back to that in a moment. So the thought here is how we hear and what we hear is very important because there are filters in which we process God's word. 
and they can have an, a, a tremendous bearing on our life. For example, even right now, you might be listening to this or watching it. Some of you who might uh, watch it later, maybe you're double-minded. Maybe you're not sure if you want to be in or out. Or maybe you're you're dealing with pride and arrogance. Maybe you're, you're, you're harboring a know-it-all spirit that, oh gosh, I've heard this before. Or maybe there's fears and wounds that can't allow you to yield to heal, healing God's healing grace. Here's a big one, our, our vested interest. We, we try to justify reasons why a change isn't necessary. This is, I'm discovering this is very true in the theological realm. Uh, people have a tendency to uh, involve themselves in what's called confirmation bias. They hear something that contradicts their own personal doctrine, and the first thing they do is rather than open their hearts to maybe what's being said, they run off to uh, find their favorite author to, to substantiate what they already believe. It's called confirmation bias, or it's also referred to as motivational motivation, motivated reasoning. I'm sorry. Some of us have a, a, uh, have a difficulty hearing because of what I call a, a therapeutic mindset. Uh, we want something, we want you to teach something that's immediately practical. We want pragmatic solutions. Don't you know that I'm the center of my life and I need you to give me steps on how to do this or that or how to have a happy life. Or, and, 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 and they're not interested in building blocks of theology and knowledge and getting to understand how God works and what his nature is like. Everything has to be spoon-fed in form of, of pragmatic solutions, as if we're the center of the world. And then maybe a final one, and there are certainly more, is what I would call redirection. They need to hear this. There's this mysterious they, somebody in the next aisle. Maybe this is for the young people because I already understand it, or this person who's struggling with this and that. And right away, we're redirecting, we're deflecting the word off on somebody else. All these are issues that are in our hearts and minds that cause us to not hear, to sort of, you know, just like Nebuchadnezzar, we hear a, a few words, and then the next thing you know, it's all muffled, muffled and our mind is going off in, in the, in the arena of our own vested interests. With that in mind, I want you to turn to Matthew 13 because there's Jesus talked about this whole idea of hearing and interpretation. So turn in your Bibles, if you will, to the 13th chapter of Matthew, a very familiar uh, set of parables. And we're gonna talk about the old familiar parable of the, the sower. And uh, the, the, I think the core of this parable and the various teachings in it, most of you uh, watching will probably are very familiar with it. But I just want to see how this, uh, from the angle of what we're talking about in terms of, of interpretation, because really what Jesus is talking about is, is how people interpret what's been said, how they interpret or process what he calls the, the word of the kingdom, the seed of the kingdom. And this is a very important parable because Jesus tells us in Mark, Mark's version, uh, in, the, uh, in Mark 4.13, that it's a kind of a key to, to understanding all parables. In Mark, he says, do you understand this parable? How will you understand all parables? And so in other words, how Jesus interprets the features of this particular parable and its symbols will help us to understand how they are applied in other teachings. So in the interest of time, we're not gonna read the whole thing. We're gonna kinda of go back over the explanation of the parable um, because he does reiterate uh, the features of the parable. So just in, again, in the interest of time, we're, we'll pick this up at uh, verse 18, but maybe before we do, we'll, we'll jump back up and, and read verse 10, because the disciples come to him and they ask him, uh, why do you speak to them, that is the Jews, in parables? And Jesus answers and says, well, to you it's been granted to know uh, the mysteries of the kingdom, but to them it hasn't been granted. And he says, to whoever, whoever has, more shall be given, and he will have an abundance, but whoever does not have, that which he does uh, will be taken away from him. 
Therefore, I speak to them in parables because while seeing, they do not see. While hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand. And he says, in their case, and he quotes from Isaiah 6, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says, you will keep on hearing, but will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. The heart of this people has become dull with their ears. They scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes. So this is a willful act, first of all, on behalf of uh, the Jews of Jesus' day. And then he says, otherwise they would see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return, and I would heal them. Blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. Truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous men desire to see and hear what you do, but do not have not seen it, and to hear what uh, uh, you hear and do not hear it. And then he goes on to explain the parable. Let's just take a few minutes to go over these uh, points again, just to refresh ourselves in what Jesus says uh, about uh, the parable of the sower. He says that when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one on whom the seed was sown beside the road. So the first thing Jesus talks about is a group of people who don't understand. And I think this is actually just a direct reference to what he has just said. There are people and using the example of the Jews themselves in his day, who simply because of um, repeated stubbornness and disobedience, they just don't get it, okay? Um, he, he looks at them as an example, and they're not going to understand what he has to say because their heart aren't, hearts aren't open to it. Their, their lives are, are, are uh over, overrun with just the disobedience and double-mindedness. Today they're a saint, tomorrow they're a sinner. And Matthew offers uh, here this additional context that is not given to us in Mark and Luke, and that, that he specifically says that if they were to repent, I would, I would open their eyes and heal them. So this lack of repentance, this arrogance, this pride, this stubbornness forbids us from... Uh, hearing and understanding at all, and the seed just falls. Uh, and of course, you know, when a sower sows seed, it's just thrown out there and, and hoping that uh, it will take root in places. The second one he tells us is uh, one that falls on rocky places. And this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. And when uh, affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. So this one comes to God with great joy, but he comes with false expectations. And when difficulties arise, they fall away. Literally, uh, the word falling away just mean, is actually scandalizo, which where we get our word scandalized. He's scandalized because we assume God is supposed to live up to our expectations. And uh, unfortunately, we find ourselves often guilty of selective hearing. We hear the things that we want to hear, that please us, that keep us in the center. And uh, of course, nothing will offend us more than someone who doesn't live up to our expectations. It reminds me of the story in Luke 7. We don't turn to it. I'll just share it with you. You're all familiar with it, that John is in prison. And John the Baptist is in prison, and he hears that Jesus is out ministering, and he sends a couple of uh, of his followers out to see Jesus. And John, you know, has this question, you know, if you're the Messiah and you're the one that's supposed to come, uh, what am I doing in this hell hole? Are, are you the one, or are we told to look for another? And, uh, you know, he's confused. Why am I here in prison when Messiah is supposed to come and overthrow Rome and those of us who are forerunners should have a place in the kingdom, and yet here I am sitting in a prison cell, no doubt going to have my, uh, uh, my, my ears lowered down to the shoulders. And so uh, Jesus uh, responds to that inquiry and says, you know, go tell John that uh, the deaf hear, the blind see, you know, people are healed, the, 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 the poor have the gospel preached to them, 
and blessed is he who is not offended in me. Now, isn't it hard to imagine why someone would be offended at Jesus? But that's exactly it. There's all kinds of wrong expectations about what the kingdom will bring in our lives and in the world today. And so we can easily be offended. We can easily misjudge when we think God is out to make our lives perfect and that, that somehow we're the center of the world and his whole mission is our well-being. And in fact, that's not the case at all. And Jesus tells us that there will be difficulty, there'll be persecution, there'll be trouble. Matter of fact, uh, I believe it's in Luke's version, he says it lacked moisture. And in one translation says that he that lacked tears. There were no tears in that process of growth. And so the tears are what water our hearts and make us uh, uh, the soil uh, uh, fertile for, for uh, growth. Then he talks about another, and there's another uh, here that uh, in verse 22, the one on whom the seed was sown among the, the thorns. This is the man who, be, who hears the word and the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. Now this speaks to those of us who treat the gospel as a, uh, the gospel of the kingdom as merely an add on to our busy life. Uh, we're probably in church every Sunday. We probably live a relatively moral life. Christianity is their religion. Uh, and we're dutiful Sunday go to meeting practitioners. Probably imagine that once a year Maybe twice a year we volunteer to collect tickets at a church event, make sure we're fulfilling our Christian obligation. But the, the work life, the family life, the business of living is still the, the center of our world. Um, rather than assimilating into the kingdom culture that God has for us, we attempt to assimilate the kingdom into our own world. And Jesus says that, unfortunately, the cares, the riches, the preoccupations with this life will eventually choke off the seed and bear no fruit. He doesn't talk about anybody going to hell here or anything like that. He's simply saying, look, there's a, there's a path to fruitfulness. And as long as you remain in the center uh, and preoccupied with everything but the gospel, and the gospel is merely a side issue in your life. And you know, these people may love the Lord, love God, and again, as I said, be very, very, very moral. But at the same time, there's something missing. There's something lacking where the somehow the gospel itself hasn't become the center of life, the central factor of life. Then finally, he tells us, The one on whom the seed was sown on the good soil, this is the man who hears the word and understands it, and who indeed bears fruit and brings forth some a hundred fold, some sixty, some thirty. This group understands it. They interpret it correctly. They bear fruit, some more than others, but all of them are fruitful. We're not finished here. What, what does this mean? How, 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 what is it about these people that's so different? He doesn't really tell us. He just says that they, they had good soil. Well, here's where, here's where context matters uh, in this particular word and the comparative analysis of of the text, because in this context, what follows in Mark and Luke, now Matthew seems to end right here, but Mark and Luke go on, and they offer important additional insights to the parable, and it has everything to do with what I'm trying to say about how we interpret, how we hear, and how it impacts our life. 
first in, in Mark 4 and Luke 8, Mark 4, 21 and 22, and Luke 8 and uh, 16 and 17, both say pretty much the same thing. I'm using my, uh, my little uh, harmony of the Gospels here. Mark says, and he was saying to them, a lamp is not brought to be put under a peck measure or bushel, or is it under a bed? It is not bought or brought to be put under the lampstand. Same thing in Luke 6, uh, verse 16, 8, 16. Now, no one after lighting a lamp covers it over with a container or puts it under a bed, but he puts it on a lampstand in order that those who come in may see the light. Then he goes on to say that for nothing is hidden except it be revealed and nothing has anything been secret that it should come to light. If any man has ears to hear, let him hear. So Jesus tells us that the lamp is not to be covered but kept on, or kept under a bed, but to be put on the lampstand. And then they both go on to say that what has been hidden is now brought to light and is no longer secret. So what's the big secret? What's the big uh, something that's being brought to light? And here's where what Jesus is saying is contextually uh, tied to the parable, because what this means can be seen in Ephesians chapter 3. What is it that's been hidden and is now brought to light? In the third, third chapter of the book of Ephesians, the letter of Paul to the Ephesians, Paul writes, starting at, I'll just pick it up at verse 8. Very powerful verse. To me, Paul writes, the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to do what? Bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which was hidden in God who created all things. We see what? Something being brought to light that was hidden. The same language we find in Mark and Luke here with Jesus' parable uh, of the sower. Something hidden is now brought to light that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places, this was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord. What Jesus is saying, what's unique about these people who are fruitful, is the fact that they understood that this gospel, this message of the kingdom, was something larger than themselves, that it was something bigger than their own private world, that they are part of a grand mission that was formed and formulated before the foundation of the world, and that it, it was worth everything they had and everything they were. Their hearts were set free from this personal uh, vested interest. They realized they're not the center. They realized the gospel is not, even though, yes, God cares for us and wants to heal us, that ultimately the the, the Bible is not a book of therapeutic information or uh, a, a book full of science, you know, uh, stuff that we can uh, compare to uh, what, what scientists are teaching. And coming full circle, what Jesus is talking about is interpretation, how we interpret his message, how we uh, hear his message, how we uh, uh, embrace his message as something larger than us. And then he adds that very self-same thought by saying in, in both texts, verse, tw uh, verse 24 of Mark 24, and he was saying to them, take care what you listen to. And in verse 18 of Luke 8, he says, take care therefore how you listen. He's telling us it's not enough just to hear the word, how you embrace it, how you interpret it, how you in process, how you process it through your inner man 
That inner man must be free from self-interest. It must be free from wanting God to be just your therapeutic counselor, wanting to domesticate him to be what we want him to be, rather than bowing before who he is. So my appeal to you, I believe the Holy Spirit's appeal to you today, is not to interpret the word through the lens of self-centeredness. Because the word of the kingdom is a message about a great mission of a great God. And he is about expanding a kingdom. You know, Isaiah wrote in, in, in Isaiah 9, something we read on our Christmas cards. He said that from the time the child is given to us, he said that, that great verse that says, them, a son is born, a child is given to us. The government will be on his shoulders and he'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, etc. And from the time he's given to us, he says the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. How we hear, how we interpret has tremendous bearing on the outcome of our lives. And, and we can go back and look again at Nebuchadnezzar because the outcome of everything that God was trying to show him was that there was an end to his central place in human history. He just couldn't hear any of that because he heard the promise that God said he was made of gold and he became the center. And he had to really learn his lesson the hard way. And unfortunately for ourselves, sometimes when God doesn't bow to our wishes, we find ourselves learning lessons the hard way. And we are ever always reminded that that he is central, that his purposes are central, and that we are, well, we have second place. Now, I want to add a few minutes of, of postscript to this story because the outcomes that Jesus presents to us in Matthew 13 and Mark 4 and in Luke 8, the outcomes of these, this parable. The marvelous thing about the grace of God is they don't have to be reversible. Anything Jesus shows us here can be reversed. If we're going in the wrong path, if we've embraced, if we've seen, if we've interpreted wrongly, these things can be reversed, folks. And we'll need to look at Nebuchadnezzar if you want to take the time to read on through that book of Daniel and just focus for a minute on this great king. He eventually had to be humbled. Seven years of humbling experience that he had to go through at the hand of God. But afterwards, he repented. And that repentance reversed the course of his life. I, I firmly believe we're going to see old Nebuchadnezzar in heaven one day. But his story, his story teaches us um, that, and over and over I'm saying this, we're not the center. And an interpretation from a clean heart, and if our our eye, if our heart be single, then our whole body will be full of light. And we can embrace that message of Christ and we can embrace that message of the kingdom and keep him front and center in our lives. I finished a little early, but I think that's about all I have to cover. Um, I guess I'm getting familiar with how this process works here. Um, I'm going to leave it there. I think I've said enough. 
And uh, I want to remind you, that, uh, stay tuned in, that Pastor Oz will be coming up at 11. Uh, I may be back next week. I'll talk it over with Pastor Oz. He said if I was happy to take a week or two. Um, it was great sharing with you. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. And uh, we will see you next time. God bless you all. Well, let's just take a moment uh, since I've got a few minutes. Let's pray and just ask God to search our hearts. Father, we, we thank you for your word. We thank you for um, not only warning us of the potential outcomes of just uh, having our heart and our focus in the wrong place, but that the fact that your grace is always adequate to turn around the course of our life and the direction that we're going in if we humble ourselves. And Lord, we pray that you would just keep us uh, kingdom focused. There are so many things. There's so many what we hear is out there that we can give attention to. So many voices, so much noise in this sound uh, battered world that we live in. And Lord, we just pray that our hearts would remain tuned into what you have to say and that we would hear and see and understand your perspective on all things. Uh, going forward today, Lord, I just pray your word will be uh, rich through Pastor Oz as he shares, and uh, that we will all come to know you just a little bit better today, Lord. We pray also, Lord, that this season uh, will end soon, and that the church will again be meeting together, sharing together face-to-face -to -face the communion of the saints. And Lord, that you put your hand on this nation. I think there's still some things that you want to do. It's not perfect. It's not without fault. But I'd still believe, Lord, that there are things that you would like to do in the world through this nation and through its propagation of the gospel. And so, Lord, we pray that you, you reverse the course of this uh, horrendous thing that's happening. And, uh, and Lord, you, you uh, bless leaders in government with wisdom and that you, uh, Lord, move mightily on behalf of your people uh, in, in the coming days. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for tuning in. Remember, tune in to Pastor Oz here at 11 o'clock. God bless you.